Welcome to the presentation, Living Well at Home. Your presenters will be Rachel and Alexa, who are both occupational therapists registered in the province of Ontario. What do all of these people have in common? If you said they all have osteoporosis, good guess, but not quite. All of these people have fallen. A quote from Brad Pitt, you may not be able to see in the picture, but he actually has a black eye. And the article that this picture came from, he states, this is what happens when you're wearing flip-flops, walking down the stairs in the dark with your arms full. Definitely a case of an avoidable fall. The purpose of this slide is to show you that anyone can fall, no matter the age. Falling is not simply just something that happens because of age, as we will explain during this presentation, but there are multiple risk factors for falling most of which are modifiable, meaning that you can decrease your falls risk. A fall is defined as a sudden and unintentional change in position, resulting in an individual landing at a lower level, such as on an object, the floor, or the ground, with or without injury. This last point is especially important. I often have clients who don't count falls that they've had if they were not injured in some way. Regardless of the injury involved, all falls are important to tell your doctor about, not just the ones causing injury. Even if fall, you fall onto a chair, that also counts as a fall. It doesn't have to be specifically falling to the ground. So make sure that you do report all falls to your primary care provider so they can work with you to help you figure out a way to avoid them. Now we're going to talk about some statistics on falling. If you fall once, you're twice as likely to fall again. Most falls are preventable and predictable, which is definitely good news for us. And approximately 90% of hip fractures in those over 65 years of age are the result of a fall. Um, in this, we see that unfortunately osteoporosis does put us at higher risk of fracturing a bone when we have a fall. Um, which further leads us to the importance of fracture prevention education, which is part of what this presentation is all about. Uh, the most common place for people to fall is actually at home. So again, this is a good thing because we can modify the home environment to reduce the risk of falling. And we're going to talk about this in greater detail later on in the presentation. Slips and trips and falls on stairs and falls from furniture lead to more than 50% of ER visits and hospital admissions for falls injuries. So it's just something to be aware of. And again, these are things that often we can change by changing our habits, by having night lights and things like that. The main point I want to get across to you is that falls are not a normal part of aging. So you always need to make sure that you're reporting them and not just thinking it's something that happens because you've gotten to be a certain age. A fracture is the medical term used for when a bone breaks. The fracture triangle includes three factors that all play a role in whether or not a fracture occurs. The three factors are the force, which is the force and direction of the fall, the fall itself, and the fragility of the bone taking impact. If one of these three factors is modified, the chances of breaking a bone after a high impact event, such as a fall, can be greatly reduced. We can modify the force by improving our balance and strength, which helps with reaction time when we slip or trip. We can reduce our risk of a fall occurring by using proper methods, as will be discussed throughout this video. And lastly, the fragility of our bones can be evaluated and treated if we proactively manage our health. This is why early diagnosis and testing is important to understand your risk of osteoporosis and minimize progression of the disease. Here we have a picture of what is called the fall cycle. In it, you can see that each of the colored arrows points to the other in a circular fashion. Around the circle are examples of how one action can lead to another, and thus the cycle begins. Start from the arrow on the top right where it says fear of falling. Think about when you may have slipped or caught yourself, or maybe you did fall but didn't get seriously injured. Even without having fallen, we can still develop a fear of falling. Having a similar experience can produce a fear of the actual fall. 
We often get asked by our doctors and medical professionals if we have had any falls recently, or maybe we know of someone in our friend or family circle that fell. The impact can make us evaluate our own risk of falling. The danger with being overly fearful is that we can get pulled into this fall cycle, as you see here. We might begin with a simple fear of falling, but if we start to reduce what we do every day by decreasing our activity, then our body starts to lose strength and bone mass, which actually increases our risk of falling. It is important to exercise within our means, but at the same time, we need to be mindful about how we incorporate safe exercise into our daily routines so that we can maintain our muscle and bone mass and decrease our risk. This can help to increase our confidence when walking or moving around. So now let's look at what factors can actually affect our chances of falling. People fall for a variety of reasons, and these reasons are called risk factors. These can include loss of footing or loss of traction, changes of reflexes with age, changes in our muscle mass, the environment, decreased sensation in our limbs, so numbness or tingling, loss of our muscle strength, changes in vision and hearing, or chronic conditions that require multiple medications. If you know and are aware of your risk factors, you can take action to reduce your chance of falling. So if you look at this little cartoon, I think it is a good way of illustrating what we're trying to get across to you through this program. So it says, warning, the greatest health risk for older adults is living an inactive life. And actually I would say the greatest health risk for almost anyone of any age, um, but more specifically, the whole purpose of this balance program is really for us to motivate people to get up and get moving, um, doing what you're able to do physically for exercise, and then doing it safely. Well, at the same time, learning about how to keep your bones strong and healthy and why it's important. Everyone can do some kind of exercise, and it's more just trying to figure out the type and amount that's safe for yourself. So we know that sitting all the time is quite bad for your overall health. Um, but especially what we talk a little bit more in this program about is for your posture and bone health. So takeaway point is we need to get up and get moving and sitting all the time is really not something that we should be doing. As you may recall from our All About Balance presentation, the first of the educational presentations we had designed, vision is one of the key senses involved in balance. So it's extremely important to make sure you get your vision checked yearly and always fill new prescriptions for glasses, wear your glasses as you've been directed, and take eye drops and any other um, eye medication you've been prescribed as recommended. Um, you may have other vision issues like macular degeneration or glaucoma or cataracts. Those are things that typically you see a specialist about. And again, follow whatever protocol you've been given by your optometrist or ophthalmologist. Very, very important um, that we take care of our vision in order uh, to, to continue to help with our balance. So some of you may already be aware, but this is really important to review. Taking multiple medications does increase the risk of falls. There's just more interactions and things that can happen. Um, you may have other symptoms and side effects. Um, so we really have to be aware of this. You need to make sure that you tell your doctor or pharmacist about any over-the-counter medications that you're taking, um, because these may interact with some of the prescription medications and they need to know about them, whether they're from a health food store, a vitamin, a mineral, anything at all. And always report new side effects that you're encountering, whether it's from an older medication that the dose has been changed or an antibiotic or anything like that. If you don't take medications as recommended uh, by your doctor or pharmacist or you don't take them at all, it really does affect your body's functioning, especially if you've been taking something for a long time and then either you lose a prescription or you decide, I don't think this is really working. I don't like how it makes me feel and you just quit it cold turkey. You really need to discuss that first with your doctor and work out something that's good for your body and, and not going to affect you overall health wise. Another tip is to only use one pharmacy, um, decreases the risk of errors and um, medication issues with doses and never take someone else's medications. 
Always keep a list of your current medications with you at all times in your purse or wallet. This just, again, in case of emer an emergency, allows a healthcare worker to have access uh, to what you're taking and to know what some of the risks are. If you'd like further information about how medications can affect your risk of falls, please watch the presentation by Andrew, who's a pharmacist here in Sarnia, that's dedicated to medications as part of this program. It is available on YouTube. So we're going to talk about nutrition and hydration because they're definitely a key part of keeping balance and preventing falls. So calcium and vitamin D are both very important. Adults over the age of 50 require 1,200 milligrams of calcium daily. And it is definitely recommended that you try and get this through your diet first. And then if you feel like you're not getting enough, talk with your doctor or pharmacist about possibly getting a supplement and how much maybe you should be taking and how to take it properly. Um, vitamin D really helps the body to absorb calcium. So we can make this, the vitamin D from the sunlight um, through our skin, but it does get more difficult with age and some medications can block the production of vitamin D. Not to mention here in Canada, we don't typically get enough sun throughout the year. So it is usually recommended to take a supplement. Um, talk again with your doctor and pharmacist about how much vitamin D you should be taking. Um, sometimes if you need vitamin D and calcium both, they can be sold together as well. Um, and you can look for fortified beverages like orange juice or milk often has vitamin D or calcium. Um, calcium is already in milk, but it can be added to orange juice and vitamin D is often added to our milk here in Canada. When we look into hydration, the dietitians of Canada recommend nine cups of water per day for women and 12 cups for men. So a good idea can be to carry a water bottle around with you, maybe have some notes up reminding you to get enough water because a lot of us don't get enough throughout the day. Inadequate fluid consumption can lead to generalized weakness, fatigue, and frailty, which increases our risk of falls, of course. So if you'd like further information about how nutrition can affect your risk of falls and the importance of, of nutrition for your bone health and some tips on more calcium in your diet, please watch the presentation dedicated to this topic as part of this program that is presented by registered dietitians and it's available on our website as well as YouTube. So often one factor that influences balance that we don't always think a lot about is hearing loss. And we did talk again a little bit about this in the All About Balance presentation, but it's really important to review. So if we have any kind of hearing loss, this causes decreased awareness of your overall environment, which overwhelms our brain, which is trying to process our balance, obstacles, keeping our walking pattern steady, or maybe we're walking on unsteady ground, which overall can increase our falls risk. So it's very important that you get your hearing checked regularly. Yearly is typically recommended. And if you are prescribed hearing aids, please wear them. They're not going to be doing you any good, of course, if they're just sitting in a drawer. And if you're having trouble with them, they're not working properly, things like that, please bring them back to the audiologist to be adjusted. They're not going to know that they're not working for you. And sometimes they have to iron out um, some of the kinks in them and, and things like this, especially if you're new to hearing aids. So really, really important um, to make sure that you're hearing properly so that you can perceive everything around you. Um, as well, if you have trouble sometimes with earwax in your ears and things like that, make sure that you get them cleared regularly as well. Sometimes we forget that our regular habits can also increase our risk of falling. Something like using a kitchen stool or a rolling chair to grab an item off a higher shelf or climbing onto an unsteady ladder can result in a fall. If we are rushing around a corner or to the bathroom at night, we might forget that we changed our home layout the day before and miss our step and fall. Another common event. Sometimes we forget that our regular habits can also increase our risk of falling. Something like using a kitchen stool or a rolling chair to grab an item off a high shelf or climbing onto an unsteady ladder can result in a fall. If we are rushing around a corner or to the bathroom at night, we might forget that we changed our home layout the day before, or we might miss our step and fall. Another common event is carrying a large load in our hands, such as grocery bags or laundry basket, and not being able to see our feet when managing staircases or ramps. It is also important to use a mobility device as it was prescribed to you. 
If an occupational therapist, physiotherapist, or your primary care provider recommended that you use a cane or a walker, it is for your safety and reduce your risk of falling. Failing to use the device as prescribed can increase your risk. Proper footwear is a risk factor that is often left to the side. We all know that not tying up our laces can result in tripping over them. But how many of us practice this when we are rushed? It often goes through our head the idea that, well, it's only for a few seconds or I just need to grab something really quick when we accidentally trip and fall. A good shoe is one that you can see here. It fits well and snug to the foot. The lacing or Velcro is attached securely. There's a heel and small arch for support and a back covering so that our feet don't slide out of our shoes. Think about whether you or someone you know uses slippers in the home that fall off as you walk up or down stairs. Doesn't seem very safe if you take a moment back to think about it, but it's also not something that we might actively pursue to change unless something like a fall actually happens. Another important factor to keep in mind is what surface we are walking on. In the next slide, we will go over this in detail. Knowing what type of surface you are walking on compared to what you wear on your feet is an important part of reducing your fall's risk. Some surfaces may be very slippery when you wear socks, but fine if you are barefoot or have shoes with rubber on the bottom. The same can go for rough surfaces, where too much traction on your shoe can cause you to get stuck and trip over yourself. There are a few pieces of equipment that can help with this. Rubber slippers or silicone ice cleats, as pictured on the top left, are made to go over your normal shoes and provide extra traction on ice. The same goes for the picture on the top right, which is a pair of hospital socks that use a rubber bottom to provide extra traction for slippery surfaces. Although not directly related to falls, elastic laces are also used for people who have difficulty tying their laces, as they are easier to manage for those with finger movement problems such as someone with arthritis. The emotional effects of a fall or a near fall can leave someone wondering, what do I do now? Remember back to the fall cycle earlier in the presentation. Even if we don't fall, the what ifs can drag us down and cause us to be overly cautious. We might lose our confidence, be afraid of falling again, or of having that big fall, and this might lead to us avoiding activities that we enjoy for fear of falling. It has been shown that the fear of falling can actually make us more likely to fall. This is why it is so important to look at our own individual risk factors and manage our health as best we can. By being in charge of our health, we can gain the confidence to know when to seek medical advice and how to best minimize our individual fall risk so that we can participate in our daily activities with confidence. Now we will look specifically at the home as it relates to safety and common equipment recommended by occupational therapists to help reduce a person's risk of falling. So the first thing that we want to talk about when we talk about home safety is the bathroom. The bathroom is one of the most common places people fall, specifically the shower. But thankfully, there are a lot of things that we can do uh, to help prevent falls and, and keep our balance. So a big one is installing wall grab bars wherever possible. They help you with transfers, staying steady if you start getting lightheaded and things like that. Please remove all mats from the floor, even ones with rubber backing as you can trip. Keep your bath rug resting over the side of your, your tub so you don't trip over it when it's not in use. So it is important to use a proper back bath rug that has that rubber backing for getting in and out of the tub. Don't use a towel as a bath rug um, as typically these can slip a lot more easily, increasing your risk of falls. The other thing as well, if you do wear a lifeline necklace or bracelet of any sort, most of them are waterproof. So check with your provider and if 
They are waterproof. Please do wear them in the shower because again, this is a big place where people fall. And so you wanna make sure that you have that safety um, fallback option if you do have a fall and can't get up on your own. Some other bathroom safety equipment can be for the toilet. Uh, so you can install a higher toilet if you're finding it difficult to get on and off. But if you're doing your sit to stands, hopefully you will improve your leg strength so you can do this easier on your own from a lower surface. Um, don't only use the countertop to get off the toilet. If possible, have something like a wall grab bar to grab onto um, or a tub mounted grab bar. Really do not want to be using towel racks for your transfers. So they easily rip off the wall, the same thing as the toilet paper dispensers. So make sure that you have something sturdy to hold on to if you need that help. Raised toilet seats as well, as you can see from these pictures can be helpful. And these toilet safety frames, um, which are often called a Versa frame, can be helpful to give you some handles as well on the toilet if you need it. As you can see from the past few slides, there's a lot of different equipment you can get for the bathroom really shows how important it is to make sure your bathroom is safe because again, it is one of the higher risk areas for falls. So usually it's recommended installing at least two grab bars like you can see in this picture, one by the entrance or exit of the tub and then one typically along the back side wall um, to help you when you're in the tub. Otherwise, sometimes you may not be able to install one because of the surface behind the wall is not sturdy enough. A contractor can definitely help you with that and an occupational therapist. Um, but otherwise you might use this tub mounted grab bar um, if you need to, or maybe you can install a grab bar just on the outside wall of your shower to help you with getting in and out. Uh, the other things that can be helpful, especially if you have trouble standing for long periods of time or you find your legs give out or things like that is a shower chair. Um, there are also stools you can get um, so you can sit in the shower and of course um, they do have that non-slip um, suction cup on the bottom of the legs of the chairs for safety. Uh, the other thing you can get is this longer chair in the picture is called a transfer bench and that allows you to sit when you're waiting to get into the tub and then just slide your bum and your legs over to get into the tub so you don't actually have to do that stepping while standing. The other thing that can be helpful, of course, is a handheld shower to help you get all the areas you need to get, especially when you're sitting, and then a bath mat, as we had mentioned before. Next, let's look at the bedroom. This is where many of us spend our time relaxing and, of course, sleeping. Many falls happen at nighttime. It is important to think about how our bedroom is set up so that we can manage our risk factors. Things to consider, as listed in detail here, include making sure our bed is the proper height. You want to be able to sit and stand with minimal effort from your bed, not jump onto it or fall down. If you experience dizziness in the mornings or are slightly lightheaded, make sure you take time to sit at the edge of the bed for a few minutes until your symptoms subside before standing up in the morning. Always have a nightlight or flashlight to get you to the bathroom and a phone nearby in case of emergency. Don't leave scatter rugs or mats that you can trip on, on the floor beside your bed where you get in. And remove any furniture that you keep bumping into or stepping around to get to your bed or to get from your bed to the washroom. Remember, move the furniture out of the way and not yourself. Here are some examples of common equipment that is used in the bedroom to help with transfers and that can help reduce our risk of falling. It includes furniture risers, as pictured on the top left, a bed rail, as pictured on the top right, a trapeze, as pictured on the bottom left, and a transfer pole, as pictured on the bottom right. Here are some examples of common pieces of equipment used in the bedroom to help with transfers and reduce our fall risk. Furniture risers are used to raise the height of a surface, such as a bed or a chair, which makes it easier to get off of. A bed rail, as pictured on the top right, is placed between the box spring and mattress and helps to provide as a stable support for someone to pull themselves out of bed and to help with repositioning. The other two pictured here, the trapeze and the transfer pole, can also help with bed transfers. Next, let's look at the living room. 
Similar to our bedroom, we want to make sure that we can get out of the chairs and couches we have set up with little effort. Ensure no scatter rugs or mats are on the floor and arrange the furniture in a way that makes it easier to get on and off. You shouldn't have to worry about bumping into your coffee table to sit down on the couch. When we talk about couches and chairs, we want to look at what makes it easier or harder for us to get off them. A lower seat surface is harder to stand up from because of the increased force required. If we can modify the height of our couches by using something like a furniture riser, then we can easily reduce our fall risk in this area. We might also look at transfer poles or more elaborate equipment like a lift chair to help with our daily transfers. Think about how often you use the furniture, how long you spend it every day, and whether someone else might be using it when you look at possible safety equipment additions to your home. So when we talk about making your kitchen safe and fall proof, again, we're talking about removing all rugs and mats from the floor. Often people will have these around their sink. Um, they are always still a tripping hazard. So really, really please do remove those mats, especially if they move around and they're not secured to the floor, but even the ones that are have a rubber backing are dangerous as well. You can catch your foot and trip on them. Keep your most frequently used items between waist and shoulder height, just makes them easier to reach. You know, you know you're avoiding reaching, standing on a chair and things like that. Um, avoid bending and reaching frequently, especially if this is something um, that you do find difficult or you find that, you know, bending down might make you lightheaded or dizzy. Try raising things up, like maybe having the garbage on a higher level or things like that. This picture here is called a perching stool, and some people will use this if they have issues standing for long periods of times while making meals. So the legs are adjustable, so it can be higher or lower depending on what you need for your counter space and things like that. So we come to the area of stairs, which we know we talked about in the statistics section can be a higher risk spot for falls. So really make sure that you have railings on both sides if possible. Again, allows for greater stability. Um, really try to limit bringing things up and down the stairs that require the use of both hands. So a lot of times we think about laundry is often in the basement. Um, we have to go down a flight of stairs for that. So if possible, either push a laundry basket down, um, maybe you can throw clothes down in a bag so you don't have to carry them with both hands. Uh, for bringing them back up, you might consider having a backpack or something um, or a bag just again so you don't have to use both sets of hands. Make sure you have at least one railing for every step. Again, that's just to help with stability because when we are going up and down stairs, we're essentially being on, on one foot for a period of time. And that's often when people find their balance is slipping, one of the harder things to do. Uh, when you're talking about outside your house, maybe the front entrance and there, you know, might not be room for a railing, you can consider using a wall grab bar for smaller sets of stairs. So it's always something you can ask an occupational therapist about, you can ask um, a vendor about this. Um, if you have a walker and you don't have help getting in and out of the house, another consideration might be to install a ramp for safety. Um, and that's, again, something that you can talk to a contractor about, talk to an occupational therapist, um, go to your health store and see what they can do for you. So when we think about making the hallway safer, again, some of this is really reiterated throughout the other slides, but we're reducing any kind of clutter. Securing rugs, preferably taking them away if they're not wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Um, again, you can catch your foot very easily on these. Watching out for electrical cords, so trying to keep those away or keep them hidden so that we're not going to trip over them. Keeping night lights around the house, um, and then of course watching out for any pets. So when we talk about the basement and making it a little more safety proof, a big thing is being aware of clutter. And please, you know, try as best you can if you need help, you know, get someone to help you clear that up again throughout the house. That's important so that you have more space to work with and less chance of tripping over something. Again, taking away throw rugs and mats from door entrances and in hallways. If you have a cold floor, that means you should wear shoes in the house, not create more tripping hazards with the mats. 
And please make sure you have good lighting so you can see around every corner. Again, that just reduces our risk for tripping over something small um, that maybe someone's left lying around. So what about pets? So here are some considerations for animals in the home and outside of the home. Um, make sure that you're aware of where, where your pet likes to nap or, you know, kind of sit and, and rest. Uh, a lot of times pets like to be with their owners. So, you know, I know sometimes our dog used to kind of get right behind us and you turn around and all of a sudden there he was, right? Almost ready to trip you. So you will be less likely to trip over them if you're at least aware of kind of what their habits are like. Um, again, this is also where night lights come in handy. You know, maybe you have a dog that likes to sleep by the edge of the bed or likes to sleep right by a doorway or something at night. Well, if we have a night light, at least we can kind of see where they've decided to, to lay to rest for the night. Make sure, of course, that you can adequately control your dog, for example, when walking outside so they don't set you off balance by pulling too hard or dashing after a squirrel. Um, you may have to shorten the leash so you have more control. Maybe you have to go out with a family member or friend um, just to make sure that you have that extra control. So those are just some little thoughts. Um, but again, the biggest thing is being aware of them and, and making sure that you can see them properly. So the night lights, especially at night, are a great idea. Um, and then just looking out for where maybe they decide to leave their toys and that kind of thing. Um, trying especially to have an area away from traffic where you keep their food dish and, and things like this. Just a quick thing to talk about for anybody that this is relevant for, or if you've been wondering if there's any funding available for mobility devices like a walker. There is a government program called the Assistive Devices Program that can provide assistance with the purchase of a new walker if you meet certain eligibility criteria. So you do have to be assessed uh, by somebody who is approved to be an ADP authorizer, what they are called. Um, this can be an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist. And you can ask your doctor if they know um, of one that they can refer you to if you think you may need a walker. If you are approved, you can have 75% of the cost of the walker covered, and then you pay 25%. If you have private insurance, sometimes they'll cover that extra 25%. And any medical store can start the process. And they typically have a list of the different people who are able to help you with that, OTs and physios in the area. So just something to be aware of. In conclusion, we hope that this presentation gave you some ideas for how to reduce your fall's risk and stay safe in the home. Our goal is to assist seniors with living well at home, which means that we stay on top of our health and have confidence in our abilities. Let's go into some of what a fall prevention plan might look like for you next. When we think about making a fall plan, it might not have to be very long or detailed. Sometimes it helps to look at all of the risk factors like a checklist and see where we might need to pay more attention. Here are examples of where to start. Getting a vision test yearly, hearing test, reviewing our medications each year with our pharmacist, regularly checking on our blood pressure, taking care of our feet if we have neuropathy or are diabetic, and to continue, we can participate in a regular exercise program, review our home for any safety hazards, learn about what equipment can help our home stay safe, and keep a fall diary. Having a fall plan is a great way to figure out all the little details that may be contributing to our risk and to formulate an action plan for what we can do about it. It has been shown that a fall plan can help decrease our risk of falling, provide for a faster response time in case of an incident, and improve our health outcomes. Now let's look at what we can do if we fall. Do we have someone who lives with us who would be able to call for help or assist us to stand? If not, do we have an emergency call button that can call a loved one on our behalf or 911 to get help? How likely are we to be able to get up from the floor if we do fall and we don't sustain a major injury? If you are able, a good idea is to regularly practice getting up from a fall. If you are a bit unsteady, have someone with you when you first try this. By practicing getting up from a fall, we can increase our body strength and confidence if we do happen to fall.
Here is a visual provided by the Finding Balance Alberta as to how to get up from a fall. First, always check for injuries and remember to take your time. Never try to stand straight back up after a fall as your body may still need to adjust for the sudden blood pressure change and you could fall back down right away. To start, look at the number one picture on the top left. When getting up from a fall, always be sure to roll to your side first. Do not try to get up by pulling on something above you or by wrapping your arms around another person. This can injure the person or yourself as the force required to pull your full body weight up off the ground against gravity is quite large. By rolling onto your side, you can get to use your arms and legs to help yourself get up. If you have knee issues, you can use a cushion underneath the knees as a temporary support to help get up. Next, go to a stable surface such as a chair. Use the surface to pull yourself up and remain seated once settled. Once you verify again any injuries sustained and have waited a few minutes for the shock to dissipate and your blood pressure to return to normal, then you can slowly get up off the chair. Always let your primary care provider, such as your doctor or nurse practitioner, know if you had a fall. Make sure to mention any contributing factors, such as a sudden onset of dizziness or your leg suddenly giving out on you. Thank you for watching our presentation, Living Well at Home. We hope you learned about your fall risk factors and took away some home safety tips for use in your own home. If you have questions about the presentation or program, please go to the websites or Facebook pages of the organizations listed here. If you're interested in a home safety assessment by an occupational therapist in your area, please contact the number listed here at 1-888-447-4468.